of you here today. Um, like Corley said, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 in just a couple of moments. We're also going, we're not going to start there though, we're actually going to start in John chapter 11. Uh, we'll have a video clip in just a moment. Uh, Dushal and I still have one more episode of The Chosen to go. The last one aired while we were on our vacation, but I was pretty blown away by uh, season four, episode seven, especially this scene. I mean, even if you haven't seen the show, it's not really a spoiler. This part's straight from the Bible, uh, and I'm pretty sure you'll know where we are right away. Take away the stone. What is it? He said, take away the stone. Was I unclear? Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead for four days. Martha, surely you know that is a minor matter. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you will see the glory of God? Your only priority in this moment is faith. I say to you again, remove the stone. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Sent? What is he doing? He already told us last night, you don't remember? He said so that we and many others might believe in him. We already believe in him. Everyone for everything. Lazarus, come out. Those 
our sermon today is not about John chapter 11, at least not directly, but I just thought this was such a powerful uh, portrayal of the, the power of the Word of God, right? Jesus speaks and, and stuff happens. So I would just invite you to stand and we will read our sermon passage for today and we'll, we'll circle back around to the raising of Lazarus uh, partway through. Coralie has already read some of this with the kids, uh, but I'd invite you to read with me again. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Now, a lot of us probably grew up with this verse, doing our sword drills and stuff, kind of as a a bit of a proof text, if you will, for the reliability and the supernatural power of the Bible. And I want to say this is certainly not wrong. This is a key verse in forming an accurate doctrine of Scripture. However, I also want us to push a little bit deeper into what this means. Because a a rigid but shallow affirmation of the truthfulness of Scripture can actually become a really dangerous thing. I don't know what you guys may or may not have seen online from time to time, but we live in an era where anybody can put things on YouTube or other social media claiming that they know all kinds of stuff about the Bible, and there's, cr- there's crazy stuff out there, right? Somebody will take one or two obscure verses from some passage in the Old Testament, and they'll create this whole system of thought based on, it's totally just ridiculous stuff, but they will say, well, see, the Bible's true, and this verse is true, and they'll, they'll take one thing, and then they'll build this whole structure of belief on that. And we have to be careful of that. Now, I would have liked to have given this message before we took a a break for our Sunday of prayer and worship, since uh, these two verses form the conclusion of a significant portion of the book of Hebrews that began at chapter 1, verse 1. And really, I think chapter 5, the chapter numbering was added much later after the book was written. Chapter 5 might have been better if it began uh, right after 4, verse 13, because we kind of start a new section then, talking about Jesus as our high priest. Uh, but if you remember, uh, well, we'll just read it, actually. Uh, if you remember verse, uh, Hebrews 1, verse 1, in the first few verses of the book, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So he begins the whole book by insisting that God really and truly did speak through the prophets in the ancient times, what we would now call the Old Testament. But climactically and ultimately, the writer of Hebrews says, God has spoken once for all through his son, through the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. As the Gospel of John so eloquently put it, see, I I would just say, in studying the book of Hebrews, I've just really been blown away and refreshed by seeing some really interesting connections between Hebrews and the Gospel of John, and we don't necessarily know Uh, how aware the writers of the New Testament were with one another's works and whatnot, but there's some really, really cool connections here. So compare what we just read in Hebrews with the beginning of the Gospel of John. Uh, Verse 1, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through Him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Verse 14, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. 
18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Right there again, we have this idea that the word of God or the revelation of God, the truth about God, finds its most clear and complete and most powerful fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we can't know who Jesus was and what he did apart from the written records that we call the Gospels. We believe, along with the received tradition of the church handed down from the apostles for 20 centuries now, that the Gospels, while they all have their different perspectives on the life of Christ and some record different events from the life of Christ than one another, that they were nevertheless based on eyewitness accounts and they were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and tell us accurately who Jesus was and what he came to earth to do. Perhaps it would be helpful at this point just to take a step back further and locate the Gospels within sort of the Bible as a whole. Here's a very simple breakdown of how you could understand the, the structure of the Bible. There's many different ways uh, that people have done this, but we could look at it this way. The Old Testament, as Hebrew says, God spoke. It's genuine, authoritative revelation from God, but it is preparatory revelation. It is preparing us for what's to come. The Gospels are God's self-revelation to his people and ultimately to the entire world in the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man who came, the Word made flesh. And then the rest of the New Testament we could see as explanatory revelation of everything that's come before, and in particular, the life of Christ, uh, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and what does that mean for people going forward after that fact. In this way, Jesus is the center or the hub around which the wheel of the rest of Scripture, the rest of Revelation, the rest of, of God's purposes for humans turns, right? Jesus is the center and everything turns around him. I kind of touched on this a couple of weeks back. The people that the book of Hebrews would have been written to were Jewish people who had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And as things began to progress, Christianity and Judaism began to be seen as two distinct systems of belief. And the Jewish Christian believers were starting to face opposition and even some persecution, even some pressure to return to the Jewish faith. Their temptation was then to see everything that had come before, and in particular the law of Moses, as kind of the main thing, and the revelation of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he did, as kind of a nice add-on to what they already had. And the book of Hebrews, one of the main parts, the main points of the book of Hebrews was to say, no, 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 the main thing is Jesus Christ. He's not a nice add-on to what you already had. He's the main thing. He's the fulfillment. He's what the law of Moses and the rest of the Old Testament was pointing to all along. He is the hub around which the whole rest of the wheel has to turn. And I sometimes wonder if we can get in, into the same danger a little bit in the opposite direction, where we can be tempted, we can look at the rest of the New Testament, and sometimes we can kind of even forget about Jesus. We don't always know what to do. And here's what I think is going on. Perhaps it's just human nature. We read the stories in the Gospels, and sometimes we don't know what to do with some of these stories, right? When God presented his ultimate self-revelation in Jesus, so much of it is presented to us in stories, right? Things that Jesus did. Even Jesus' own teaching was often presented in stories, in the parables. And sometimes what we want, we want a system. We want principles. We want rules. We want... We want stuff like that. We want things A, B, C, D, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 lists, right? That's kind of what the people that wanted to go back to the Jewish roots of their faith were looking for. Spell it out for us in the law of Moses. And sometimes we want the same thing. Here's what we need to understand. At the heart of the written word, the Bible, is the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. At the heart of the, the structural word, if you will, is the personal word. 
at the heart of our faith is Jesus of Nazareth, who we believe was and is the Son of God. So what does it mean when it says that the word is living and active then? It's worth pointing out that in the New Testament's original language, Greek, the sentence of the verse begins with the word living, which doesn't come across really well in our English translation. You see, uh, in the Greek language of this day, and some other languages still, you can kind of play with the word order in a sentence the way we might use italicized text or all caps with three exclamation points at the end to make a point. So what they would do is they would often put a word either at the very beginning of a sentence that was the main word, or they would save it up and save it up and then put it at the very end like a big exclamation point on the end of a sentence. So here, uh, the writer is starting this sentence with living exclamation points. So living the word of God is and active. This is again why I believe it's not simply talking about scripture in terms of the written commandments, but in terms of the risen and living Savior who is at the center of it. Friends, we won't come to truly love the written word of the Bible if we do not know and if we are not intimately connected with the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've said once or twice in this series already, one of the major points of the book of Hebrews is to affirm that yes, Jesus came, Jesus ministered, he did miracles, he taught, he died, he rose again. Those are past events. They were even past events for those people, right? Most of them were not eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus. They're probably uh, believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They didn't actually walk alongside Jesus when he was on earth, right? But because, the writer's telling them, because Jesus rose from the dead and because Jesus is risen and ascended and is at the right hand of the Father, you can know him. You can have a relationship with him. You can be connected with him. That's what the whole rest of the book is really going to get into when it talks about Jesus being our living high priest that we can go to. We believe that Jesus really and truly is present by his spirit when we get the Bible out, when we open it, when we read it, when we pray, when we worship, when we celebrate communion. We believe that by the spirit, Jesus is present among us. And you know, this, this isn't just a nice sentimental way of saying, yeah, well, we remember him. We keep his memory alive. I know I've probably said this a number of times as well. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, he did not say, friends, my apostles, I'm going away, and it's as if I will be with you always. He did not say that. He said, behold, I am with you always, all the days, until the end of the age. The word active flows from the fact that the word is living. And I think we get that. But let's just make sure we're clear that active isn't so much about activity, like a lot going on, as it is about accomplishment. That's why I showed the clip at the start, and that's why I wanted to circle back around to that. Right? That when Jesus... I just love, I love how they filmed that, where the crowd kind of stays behind, and Jesus kind of takes a few steps closer... And then he gives the command for Lazarus to come out, right? Jesus knew what he was going to do the whole time, right? Even when he says, roll away the stone, they're like, I, I don't think that's a good idea, Jesus. He's been dead for a few days now. The smell is going to be really bad. And I, I also love that when they did roll away the stone, the smell, in fact, was really bad. Like, they're showing, no, he's really dead. There's no, there's no mistaking it. Lazarus is dead in there. And Jesus walks up and tells him, to come alive again and walk out. I also just love how they filmed when you first see, did you hear the heartbeat in the soundtrack as well? When, when, and then Lazarus comes into the frame and it's filmed from inside the tomb so that when Lazarus rises from the dead, the audience, we're looking at Jesus the same as he was. The point being that when Jesus speaks the word, even death has to obey him. 
right? There's nothing beyond the power of Jesus' word. When he speaks, it has to be obedience. That's powerful. That's living and active. That's accomplishing things. So what is meant by the comparison to a sword, though? The writer goes on to say the word is like a sword. It cuts. It says it divides things, right? It pierces. That's the second reason I actually wanted to show that clip with the raising of Lazarus. Jesus also talked about his public ministry being like a sword. He said he didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. Matthew 10, verse 34. Here's the thing, when we rightly understand what the Bible is about, and when we rightly understand the point of Jesus' message in particular, it pushes us toward a decision. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is usually regarded as Jesus' greatest and most powerful miracle. In the Gospel of John, if you're familiar with the structure of the Gospel, there's a number of what Uh, the gospel calls signs, great miracles that Jesus performed. And that is the first half of the book up to John chapter 11. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is the final sign that Jesus does in John's gospel. It's the final one. It's regarded as the most powerful one. And it begins to set in motion things which then cannot be undone. This is from just the next part of John chapter 11, after Lazarus is raised from the dead. It says, Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and the Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do, they asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. And from chapter 12, just maybe flip over the page. I don't know if you have it open. That's okay. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. You see what's going on there. Jesus' greatest miracle is also the thing that ultimately divides people, right? It draws a line between those who are on Jesus' side, the apostles and Mary and Martha and Lazarus and quite a large crowd and people who are not with Jesus, right? They're even willing, they're even willing to try to do a cover-up, right? If they can kill Lazarus, then they can be like, no. What do you mean he was raised from the dead? He's dead. We all know he's dead. That's where they want to go. The word spoken with power raised Lazarus from the dead. But it also revealed and judged what was in the hearts of those who witnessed it and those who heard about it. For some, that word of power that Jesus spoke caused them to believe that he was the Messiah that he was the one God had sent into the world, that he was the son of God. And for others, it pushed them to decide that they were willing to even commit murder to try to be rid of Jesus. It revealed that their hearts were evil, that they were filled with fear and envy and pride and even murder. Here's the other thing. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 talks about how the word pierces to the innermost depths of our hearts and our souls. It reveals and it evaluates and it judges what is there. But the results of when that happens don't just get to remain private. This was the point of what Jesus was meaning when he compared his own ministry to a sword. People would have to decide where they stood in relation to who Jesus was. And that it could divide them from those who had been close to them. And this would have been the reality faced by the people that Hebrews was written to. Right? As as Christianity, as the faith in Jesus came to be more and more separated from its Jewish roots and origin, people were going to have to decide. Were they going to stand with their the Christian brothers and sisters, the new community of faith around Jesus? 
even if that divided them from others? Or would, would they go back? Would that, would that division be too much? Now, we may not face that exact temptation. And again, not every single issue is a hill to die on either. Sometimes we can get a little overzealous when we read those passages about, you know, uh, faith in Jesus and it being like a sword and all, and we get to think every, every issue is a line in the sand that we've got to divide over, even from other Christians who happen to have minor differences of opinion. Whatever we're going to do with these verses, though, we need to move beyond just a theoretical understanding and into the realm of practical obedience. Most weeks, we have our church's reason for existence displayed on banners at the front of our worship space. And it reminds us of why we're here, and it reminds us of what we're supposed to do. We come here together, we gather together at other times throughout the week as well, and we do that to prepare a foundation on God's word. And of course, that means engaging with the written word that we have in the Bible, studying it, reading it together, becoming familiar with it, maybe memorizing it. We read it together, we read it on our own. But I also hope it means that we, we seek the living word as we do this, that we see that Jesus Christ is alive today and that he's a person that we can know for ourselves. Certainly, yes, we can know that he died for our sins. We can know that he rose from the dead, but also that he lives eternally. And he promises to be present with us. We don't just necessarily know about him. We can know him. And this makes all the difference as we seek to do the next steps of practicing his teachings. The presence of Jesus in his word by the spirit, that presence of him among us is powerful enough to change us into the sort of people that want to follow Jesus' teaching, that want to obey what he says for us to do, even if it means stepping into the final stage of our mission statement here, where we're willing to risk, right? Where we're willing to obey, even if Jesus were to call us to do difficult things. So what do we do with this? Again, as I say, we need to move beyond just the, the theoretical understanding where it's like, yep, I, I agree with that. That's great. But what do we do with it? We all go, I think, through seasons where we find it a challenge to spend much time in the Word. It happens to us all. We get busy. Other things come up. The kids are needy. We get interrupted. Anyone else found that the reality is just a sad reality that forming Good habits always seems to be a lot harder than forming bad ones. Uh, and for some reason, you can fall off the wagon of, of good habits, and you can't really fall off the wagon of bad habits. Like, you can't fall uh, into, into good habits. For some. It's just the way it is, right? And I don't want to come across as, well, just try harder then. If you've been listening, right, I keep telling you it's not just about, you know, knowing the facts. It's about knowing the Lord. So, we, you know, you can talk about having a good Bible reading plan or what type of day will work best for you or how to minimize distractions and all of that. And those are super important. Those might be things you need to consider. But very rarely will we put that kind of effort into something we don't love, at least into something we don't love, like a little bit at least, Right? But if we encounter Jesus, right, if we open up the Bible and we read it, and we encounter Jesus when we do that, and we experience his love, we experience his presence, then we can begin to understand more and more how the word is living and active. And you know, maybe... Maybe it is just as simple as, as asking him. Right? You remember what Jesus taught, right? In his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. One of the, the cornerstone verses there says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And what 
better thing would Jesus want us to ask for than to know his presence, to know and love him more and more deeply? Maybe it is as simple as taking him at his word, as basic as asking, seeking, and knocking, as straightforward as praying and trusting that he will be present to us and speak to us. So in just a moment, we'll, we'll conclude our teaching time in prayer and we'll, uh, we'll worship in song again after that. But we do just want to take a moment to take Jesus at his word, to ask him to speak to us, to consider what areas in our lives, in our own personal lives, in the lives of our families, do we need to hear Jesus speak a word of power over us the way he spoke at the tomb of Lazarus, to call the dead things back into life, or to say, you know, unwrap him, untangle him from that stuff, and let him go. That's the stuff, that's dead stuff. What areas in our lives do we need to, do we long to hear Jesus speak those words of power? And then let's ask him to do so, and let's trust that he will. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we long to experience not just the, the truth, the accuracy of, of your word, Lord. We trust that. We believe that. We know that. But Lord, it's the cry of our hearts to experience the living and life-giving reality of your word to experience, Lord Jesus, your very presence with us. It is our longing, and Lord, we come from any number of different situations in this week or month or just this season of our lives uh, that has brought us to this day and brought us to this time of worship this morning, Lord. We carry different burdens, we carry different fears, uh, anxieties, dreams and hopes and discouragements and all the rest. We have many different, many different situations, Lord, but so many of them uh, we need, we long for you to speak a word of truth and power, a living and active word over those areas of our lives. We trust you with this, Lord. You said to ask and to seek and to knock, and we can't think of anything better than to ask and seek and knock for your very presence in our lives. And so will you do that today, Lord? Will you touch those areas of our lives that need it the most, where dead things need to be called back into life, where your truth needs to confront lies that we've come to believe? where your power needs to be the most evident in areas of our weakness, Lord. Whatever it is, Lord, we trust you and we look forward to what you're going to do today and in the days ahead. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.